Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being the show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Lucifer as well as the latest episode of Supergirl. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include the time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I have to say about this week's episode of Lucifer, you can skip to what I have to say about this week's episode of Supergirl. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Lucifer. A great episode we are finally after such a after a little while we are finally picking up with um lucifer and kane um it's kind of interesting because kane kind of points out the fact is that he um is not the one behind everything he did have lucifer kidnapped that basically the guy that was claiming to be the sinner man was actually was someone that was important to him but it was like that was his right hand man and it seems like it's probably more like a brotherhood type of thing because it's like in a sense of like, because we saw before, like, he knew the Sinner Man when he was a kid. So it's probably like a situation of like, he grew, they grew up like brothers. Or maybe he treated the Sinner Man more like a son. Which is kind of interesting, calling him your right hand man and everything, with, especially with that situation. Because it makes it seem more like a, almost like a mafia type of thing. But nevertheless, um, for him it's like, the Sinner Man, the quote unquote Sinner Man, went off and did stuff on his own. Everything he did was behind that's why he put him down because it was just kind of like he was kind of going rogue so which begs the question okay so he was going rogue but who was he working with because it also adds in a whole question of like if it if he wasn't working with Kane then who was he working with you know because it's like because later on the conversation comes up because of like he's like I didn't do it the whole like taking away your double face and wings I didn't do that which could would beg would still beg the question of like how would someone do that you have to be like pretty powerful celestially to be able to do something like that, I feel like, to give him back his wings permanently, because his wings had not grown back subsequently since he cut them off the first time, but they just keep magically popping up, plus he's also his devil face, so it makes you wonder, like, what's up with that? The stuff that later on, it kind of pops, I'll get to that in a second, that kind of goes over that, but, um, it's just like, how do you do that? I mean, and how would Kane have been able to do it anyway? Because it doesn't seem like Kane's ain't got any mystical powers, like, is it not, like, is it some kind of like ancient spell or something like that? I don't know, because in the grand scheme of things, it's like, for him, it's like, I'm a normal human being. I just, when I, I don't die, I still feel pain like any other human, but my wounds just heal relatively fast, so. And it's kind of interesting, and I love the twist to his story of being like, no, like, I didn't come here for you, I'm not messing with you. The reason I came here was for Chloe, and it's like, what? The moment he said it, I was like, oh, right, because Chloe's special, because she made Lucifer human, and it turns out to be the case, yeah. She, because she made him human, he was thinking he, he, she could do the same thing to him, because he is close to being more but it's like his like immortality he was hoping it'd be taken away just like lucifer which does but also begs the question why is it that chloe's situation only affects lucifer it never affected anyone else it doesn't affect maze it doesn't affect the minadil it only affects lucifer it also seems like it doesn't affect um pierce either which apparently that whole like him getting shot situation he set that up he set everything up so he would get shot be near chloe and everything that's why he's kind of been i guess being a little hard to push her away but also keeping her a little close like opening up to her and everything so but that was that was a nice and that was an interesting thing because it does put that more in perspective because in all honesty i never really thought about that too much it's like we're three seasons in, and it never crossed my mind why Chloe's thing has not worked on anyone else. Why is it specifically tied to Lucifer? What made it specifically tied? Because we know Aminadil had something to do with this, but maybe it's because maybe because Aminadil is an angel, and because well, then like no, because I feel like if it was just. I was wondering if, like, because this was all concocted by an angel, like, Aminadil's powers kind kind of went about. Because we never really went into like how he made that happen. It was just kind of like I guess. Angels just had the mystical ability of just making miracles happen, so hence Chloe was, you know, conceived and everything. Or did God give him something specific to make? Like, did he give God, like, did God give Aminadil an item to be like, okay, use this to channel your power through and make Chloe? So maybe there's a little bit of godhood mixed into Chloe's whole situation, or. Like, maybe it's something that's buried deep down and she doesn't even know it. I mean, because you can't, because obviously she's a normal human. But, you know, I'm just curious, like, is it something that's kind of, like, in her essence? Like, how that whole situation works? To weaken Lucifer, but no one else. You know, like, what is that? Like, it's, it's so fascinating. I never thought about that until I started sitting here talking about that. Like, I don't know why that never crossed my mind. It's been a blatant question since the first... I mean, we found out why it happened, but we don't understand, like... When we know how it happened, but not why it happened or like what its purpose is, you know. So it's just kind of an interesting thing to me. Still, there's a part of me that is kind of got 
reservations about this whole situation because I still feel like Kane is hiding something. Like, I think this might all be some grand scheme against God because he kept saying, like, I would never work with God, which is like, I don't know. It seems like that's something him and Lucifer are going to bond over just how much they dislike dislike him. But it's like part of me wondering, is this all manipulation? Because it did seem like the sinner man kept being like, oh, I want you to kill me. And it's like, for what purpose? Is it because like, I brought it up before, like Maze had brought it up in the other episode of being like an angel killing a human is a big no, no. It's gonna, there's going to be consequences for that. So whoever he's working with might have set it up like that. So it's like, I mean, why is him and Kane separate? Why did he go rogue and everything, you know? It's questions like that. It would still kind of elude us a little bit. So I just thought that was kind of a fascinating thing. Like, and obviously, there's a lot more to this episode. Obviously, that's just like kind of the overarching thing. Like, the main plot plot in this episode dealt with a surfer named Moondog dying, and obviously, Lucifer and Chloe are still on the outs. Which he's kind of ignorant to the whole aspect of like, oh, she's mad at me. But it was like, he's in his eyes because it's like everything I did was for you, whether you realize it or not. And this episode also pointed out something interesting to me too. Like that they, like at least in Lucifer's case, he tries not to look at look Chloe as in the whole like an intimate way because he was like oh yeah our friendship our friendship it's like oh yeah and it's like oh that's so interesting because it's i guess because you know in his mind like i knew there's a reservations between the relationships obviously chloe has her reservations because it's like well lucifer doesn't always tell her everything and in his case it's like well he thinks his dad's behind like them having any like chloe having any feelings towards him so he feels like it's further manipulation by his dad so i guess that's for him it's like that's why we're going to go back to being friends which i knew that was a thing but it was just like i thought there would i mean because there's always steps forward and there's steps back and it's just like lucifer always takes a couple steps back because he doesn't want he he likes things the way they are and even if it doesn't mean anything between him and chloe at the very least he still gets to be around her i think it's kind of his you know justification for it but him saying like oh yeah our friendship and everything i was like huh that really kind of caught my attention because i thought like things were kind of intensifying between them and which kind of once again Again, as the whole situation appears, kind of making it a lot interesting because it's like, oh, it seems like Chloe's kind of getting close to him. Whether it's an intimate way, I don't know. She does like him in the sense of like, oh, I want you to stay because, you know, he was originally going to leave because it's like, well, there's no reason to stay around anymore because it's only hope. He's lived his entire life. And even Lucifer kind of is a little sympathetic because he's like, oh, your life is basically a living hell. Like you're trapped. You've watched everything and everyone you've ever known and loved kind of disappear while you, you just keep going. That's the suckiness that is mortality, dude. Um, makes you wonder what else has he done over the course of all the time that he's been alive. But nevertheless, um, he, but he was going to leave because his last hope was Chloe and it turned out to be nothing. So, but, uh, bes besides all that, uh, Getting back to the main case, like, Chloe is pissed at Lucifer, and he's trying everything to kind of make it up to her, but obviously she sees through it. It's like, you only want me to help you so that I can, you want to help me and be like, oh, I'll help him and everything, because you're trying to butter me up so I can help you investigate so on. And at the same time, there's a the whole sto um, kind of Ella and um, Charlotte story, which kind of ties into Pierce. So I thought that's kind of nice, because Ella's Ella wasn't acting herself. I'm like, oh, yeah, she's, like, super quiet and everything, and being very, like, yeah, I'll, I'll look. And it's like, you're not acting like yourself. And it's like, oh, why not? And it's like, well, because Pierce yelled at her, and it's like, and even, in, like, Charlotte's like, really? But I guess it's just because... I mean, to be fair, we don't know where that could stem from. That could be, like, one of those situations, and it kind of goes into the episode, because Mazda can kind of brought the same thing about Chloe. It's like, oh, you're mad at me because of something else. It's like, well, maybe that's the case. Maybe for Ella, it's like that yelling, being kind of torn down by someone, maybe... I mean, maybe it's just something that never really happens to her, but also maybe it kind of stems something from, you know, maybe her personal life or family life that we just don't know about. Maybe that kind of, that's why it hit her a mark or something. I mean, the fact that matters, we still don't know about the situation about Ella. She did hear, I mean, she did bring up the fact is that, well, the fact is that she does, like, she kind of acts the way she does to kind of keep the voices quiet in her head, and we never went back to that. So it's like, well, maybe there's a situation there where, like, there's, like, she hides it from most people, but maybe she has, like, a mental condition where it's, like, maybe she has, like, a... Um, not, not, maybe like something like the schizophrenia type of situation, but she tries to keep it on the wraps or like, you, you know, like, you know, that's what I'm thinking. That's how I've kind of always thought, but we'll just kind of weigh on that. But so I don't know. It could be more than, I mean, it's also because she respects him and for him to kind of tear her down and yell at her like that it made her feel small. And Charlotte's kind of telling him like, oh, you need to toughen up. You know, you need to get thicker skin. 
but then like she went and chewed Pierce out about it, which I thought was oh, man, look at you being a friend and everything. Because whether Ella will uh, be appreciated or not, it's like and Charlotte probably looks at Ella as like a friend, and it's just like oh, if I was back being a prosecutor, I would drown you into the dust. And then just pouring his coffee out, it's like wow, because that shows you she's actually very caring. Like I, I doubt the. Uh, who Charlotte was before all of this, before being possessed by Lucifer's mom, that Charlotte, I doubt she would have cared as much. So, but the fact is she looks at to Ella as a guy and a friend. I thought that was just kind of an interesting touch. Pierce later on apologizes to her because it's like, yeah, I was in a bad place. But, you know, you did have her first standing up for herself. Um, and he's like, I am sorry. I was in a bad place. She's like, you were in a bad place. Do you need a hug? And he was just kind of like, okay. And she hugs him. And he's like, you're going to miss me, aren't you? I'm like, oh, you're so adorable, Ella. Um, and she's kind of back to herself. So that was kind of good. I thought that was kind of a neat thing. Because I was I was actually surprised. I was like, oh, wow. She really bummed about him yelling at her like that. So like I said, there could be more to that. But we'll just kind of have to wait and see whether or not that is the case or not. I feel like it just seemed like there was definitely more to that. But like I said, that could just stem from the fact is that she's just never really, you know, because of her bubbly personality, not many people have ever kind of gotten her about that. So it was kind of a new thing. Especially because it's like she felt like she was being chewed up, chewed into by like, you know, someone that she respected and looked up to, you know, so it's one of those things of kind of feeling like you're being let down by your hero. It's like, oh, they're not the person. Like, it's like one of those things like, oh, you meet your favorite celebrity and they turn out to be a douchebag a little bit. It's kind of like that. I think it's kind of why it was kind of like, oh, that kind of bummed her out, you know? Because one of her biggest qualities is the fact that she talks a lot, but most people are kind of okay with it. But for him to kind of chastise her for one of the things, one of her like, most notable qualities. It just kind of, you know, it's enough to make, you know, anyone very self-conscious, essentially. It's what, what that really comes down to. She became super self-conscious about it, so. Um, it's actually surprising with the case, many different directions. For one, Dan going undercover. I appreciate the fact that you always learn something new about Dan every season. It's like, oh yeah, you take improv classes, and also, at, well, not improv classes, but you're part of it. You take, you do improv and everything, and then on top of that, you also surf. That's incredible. I also love the fact that they're constantly like, yep, he's very good at pissing off people. It's like, I kind of feel a little bad for Dan because it's like, oh, that's that's all people are going to know you for. Dan, oh, he's super good at pissing people off. Um, um, There's a point, part of me that also wonders, like, is there any potential between him and Chloe kind of getting back together? It seemed like that might not be the case. We haven't really dived any deeper into, like, the whole, like, Charlotte and Dan thing. Like, but maybe that's something we'll see kind of going forward. But, like, because they were going to go out for coffee or something like that. We never really found, I don't think they ever found out, like, what happened there. Like, you know, was it good? Was it bad? Like, that whole situation, so... But um, the case in particular, um, he was uh, with those that group known as the Orcas. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Dan hanging around them a little bit more because he kind of embraced that life. I guess he knows a little bit more about that surfer life because he was there when they were having that ceremony for like that thing, kind of like a, almost like a funeral for Moondog. It's like, okay, he's with the ocean now and everything. And so like, laying down the flowers um, and splashing the water like that. I was like, that's so neat because he just automatically kind of went along with it so he knew what it was. So part of me wonders, is he going to flow with that crew for a while or something like that? It'd be kind of neat if we saw um, that happen, but maybe that won't be the case. Um, but what's kind of interesting to me is that the fact is this whole case stemmed from a lady, uh, what was her name, Justine? She killed Moondog to set a point. He just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time because she's like, oh, this is my property and these people, they just come and go. They just litter. They're just like, Ugh, this is my place. And she just killed Moondog to set an example of basically being like, it's like a scarecrow to uh, birds. It's like, oh, don't mess with these crops. This is our property. Don't get up here. Essentially, that's what Moondog was supposed to represent. Like, oh, a warning. And it's like, I don't, I don't get, I get there like on your property and stuff like that, but to go that far like that, that's kind of a crazy reason because it wasn't even thing personal. It was just like, he just happened to be there. So she just snapped and it's like, that's the most pitiful reason to like, I mean, there's never really a good reason to kill someone, but it's just like, that was just like the most like, that's super messed up. You know, so I just, I don't know. That was kind of interesting. It wasn't anything like, oh, this and that, some personal situation. Oh, it's an affair type of situation. It's like, no, it just happened to be there when I snapped. It's kind of what that all comes down to, so. But I did also appreciate this case did help bring Lucifer and Chloe back together. I thought it was going to be like a little more, like longer of them being pissed off at each other. But he said the right thing. And she's like, why are you even here? You want me to help? He's like, no. 
like the fact of the matter is I no longer need your help with the whole like oh what he was doing granted she doesn't know he wanted to investigate Pierce I wonder what she would have thought if she had found out would he have ever told her either also side note he hasn't told anyone else I mean the only person he's told is Linda but even Linda I don't think she knows that Pierce is Kane I think she only knows about Kane Maybe he explained it, but in, in between the conversation they had, it didn't seem like she was like, oh my god, you're, wor like, you were working with Kane. Like, I don't, you know, so. And I'm curious to kind of dive into that, too. I'm just thinking about that. I didn't bring that up before, but learning more about him and Abel, like, why that happened. Because it's kind of the same situation of, like, Lucifer, like, spending time with him. You kind of finally got to know more about, like, the family dynamic. We still don't 100% know, like, what happened for Lucifer to, Lucifer to have fallen and been cast out and everything like that. Like, all we know is kind of rebelled against his dad. That's about it. But still, we don't really know the exact details. Maybe they kind of brought it up in earlier seasons, like season one, but I don't I don't really remember them expressly being like, this is the reason why Lucifer got kicked out. Maybe that's something we'll eventually get when Lucifer confronts his dad or something like that. I don't know. Um, like, the point is, I'm just trying to make is like, maybe there's more to the whole Cain and Abel situation, like why he did what he did, you know? So, but other than that, no one else knows. Like, I'm curious, will he tell anyone? It's, not, it's like, and even Cain gave a good response. Like, go ahead and tell anybody. And like, anyone's, people don't even believe that you're really the devil. So they're not going to really believe you about the whole me being Cain situation. So there's that. Um, but getting back to what I was bringing up, um, the fact of the matter is he, he said the right thing of being like, oh, well, I know like this case is important to you. And what's important to you is important to me because we're partners. And it's just like, she was like, well, you, you should, next time you should just say that from the beginning. So it's like, okay, they're in good terms again. So I'm uh, still curious to see what that means with the whole Pierce situation, especially because Lucifer is like, yeah, stick around. I will help you because it's like, because in his eyes, it's like everything has been a manipulation by his dad. Like me getting my wings back, me getting my wings back was to help me get back in time because you needed me out of the way so you could, you know, try and prove your theory right and get close to Chloe so that you can, um, you know, die and, you know, finally be free of this whole curse. But it's like, I got my wings and came back sooner. So this is all part of my dad. It's my dad's plan to stop you. So kind of like, let's give a middle finger to my dad. I'm going to help you finally end it all. And it's like, well, how will you do that? It's like, we'll figure out a way. So that's kind of interesting. That's a very interesting way to take the plot. Wasn't expecting it. It's like, oh, I thought we we're going to be enemies. It's like, no, we're going to be allies working together towards this. So. I wonder will it involve him telling anyone the truth, especially a mini deal, considering the fact is I feel like a minute I mean, I'm curious to know how a mini deal would act, or even Maze, how would she feel about him? Him being like the first killer and everything, maybe that might be like, oh maybe Maze will be like, oh my god, it's an honor to meet you. Minidel most likely not as happy about that, so yeah, they, maybe he's expressly done that. It's like Lucifer's one thing, but a Minidel being like the oldest angel is kind of like, uh, the firstborn, I'm, I don't think he's going to really be all. I didn't even think about that, the, the whole situation between them. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Maybe that's what that's supposed to be doing, setting up parallels between them. It's like, well, Minadale and Lucifer being brothers, Cain and Abel. Maybe that's what that's kind of like all, kind of, not really an allegory. Well, maybe allegory would be the right word. I don't know. Maybe like that's kind of what that's supposed to kind of represent. But nevertheless, we'll kind of, I guess, get into that at some point in time later on down the road. But it's like he's not been in the same room with a minute out, which why would he? But still, um, maybe they've done that on purpose. And maybe it's going to be interesting when they first meet, especially when the truth comes out. But nevertheless, that also brings up the question like, you know, and this question that's always come up is like, is this really God's plan? Like, everything that's happened, you know, it's, like, up to this point, like, even to Lucifer at this point in time, like, what, is this really, I'm curious, like, will we ever find out an answer, like, is this really God's plan, or has God actually got nothing to do with this, and it's just kind of, like, chance, you know? Does chance and free will actually exist in this world or not? And then you have to beg, like, you know, or is Lucifer right and his dad is manipulating him on certain regards? You know, was putting Chloe in his path his dad's manipulation, but subsequently since it's like, no, everything that happened was just, I put her there to kind of, um, maybe, maybe it was his way of kind of making up, you know, it's like, okay, I wanted you to get a second chance of life. It's kind of interesting because May said something earlier to Chloe of like, oh, Lucifer will never change. He won't change for you, which is kind of interesting considering the fact is like, that's all she ever said in season one was how much Lucifer changed, like being on earth. It's like, well, Chloe has changed him a lot. Like, especially compared to like who he was. Yes. A lot of his, personality and aspects about him are similar but like i feel like he contemplates things a lot more and not just because of chloe there's also everyone in his life things between him and aminadil things between him and mace definitely things between him and linda like having a friend like her to talk to about stuff like that her being the only person the only human who knows everything you know so i don't know
we would just have to wait. See, I get the feeling at one point in the series, it's just going to be him and his dad having a conversation. He's going to be like, actually, that was not all me. Yes, yeah, the Chloe thing, sure, but not everything else. That was all on you, son. So we'll just kind of have to wait and see. Uh, and that's not the only thing. Uh, final note of the episode is, let's also talk about the Amenadiel and Linda thing. What was kind of interesting to me was they had a conversation like, we can't be seeing each, uh, each other behind Maisie's back. So it's like, can't continue. So it's like, oh, it wasn't just that one hook up like you've continued bond like that's why linda felt extra guilty because i knew she felt a little guilty it's like oh you slept with a minute it was like well it was before you know maze let you know that was a problem it's like oh no because you've continued to subsequently still see each other even behind your back i was like yeah that's especially because it's like maze wants to give her a knife and everything and she feels bad about it then there's the whole like thing about a minute having chlamydia and it's just kind of like oh for him it's he's never been sick before now he's got possibly this whole situation and it's like well he had sex with a prostitute was like, oh, come on i didn't know she was a prostitute i don't love that conversation with linda later on is like he was like she threw that in his face and he's like well what about you you had sex with lucifer probably like you know what was it basically like the sluttiest person on earth or something like that um so it's kind of like don't cast stones at me but it's like oh yeah it was just a false positive he doesn't actually have chlamydia which i'm sure linda was like yeah i mean yeah i'm i'm fine with you it's a good thing you don't have chlamydia because that means i don't know chlamydia so that's good but for Linda, it's like she didn't want to continue the relationship, even though she does legitimately like Aminadil and he likes her. But it's like we're doing this behind Maze's back and it's not fair. It's like Maze considers me such a good friend. She's going to give me a knife as a present for being such a good friend and everything. And it's just like, you know, it's just, it's that hard to fight that attraction. And then you see that Maze is nearby and she sees it. And it's like, ah, oh, because what makes matters worse is that you lie to her about it. I'm very interested because, like, the moment Lucifer probably finds out about it, it's like, oh, really? You've been knocking it? Oh, nasty. Uh, if I'm, you know, it won't affect him as much as Maze. But because for, for Maze, it legitimately stems from the fact is it's just a situation of you will still have feelings for a mini deal and you don't want anyone else to have them. It's that situation. I want to be with him, but I don't want anyone else to be with him, especially for Linda. Um in that you know regard to i mean maze would never admit it like that but that's the, the heart of the issue here she has feelings for him and just can't can't shake him and it's just like i'm curious to see what that means going forward because linda is one of her few friends um because even with her and chloe her and chloe are friends but it's like i guess there's still that separation of like they're kind of roommates so there's there's a level of friendship there sure but it's like the person she's closest to is like linda so it's a big betrayal, but I was I was going Lutu, uh, Lutu is like, Lucifer doesn't like lies. He doesn't like being lied to, and I think Maze is kind of the same way, too. She doesn't like people lying to her, and also because it's also like she doesn't like being manipulated either, and it's like, oh, you're both lying and manipulating me, so um, you were both going behind my back and stabbing me in the back like that, so. Because at the heart of the issue, it's kind of interesting. Maze is a lot more like, um, what would be the word? She's a lot more soft-hearted than you think she is. Just being like hell's number one torturer, you wouldn't think she is. You know, hey, maybe that's just you know her time on Earth has changed her as well. But she's a lot more, um, she's a lot more sensitive than you would give her credit for. So I don't know. I just love that. that's a very fascinating situation. I am very eager to see where that goes, well, along with everything else too, especially with this whole Cain situation, Lucifer helping him. Uh, trying to die so i'm curious to see where this goes um so hopefully we'll be having lucifer stick around for a while because obviously it came back for a while and it took like a three-week break and now it's back again so it's like okay so hopefully this time uh it'll be sticking around for a while because i'm very interested to hurry up and see like what this rest of this season has in store for us especially the next episode and now moving on to this week's episode of Supergirl, another great episode. I do love that we are bringing Fort Ross back. Fort Ross hasn't been a thing subsequently since season one, so I thought that was just kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, I knew ahead of time because I saw the episode, episode title, but I really love the fact is uh, kind of bringing that back into the story in some shape or form. It's kind of on a minor scale. It's just kind of like the setting. Nothing too big happened from it. Well, I mean obviously the circumstances of the episode but I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll get to that soon enough a lot of interesting things before we even dive into that one is the fact is that i love that basically there is a, a radiation from the blue star that is located near it's like yeah it kills anything with the y chromosome and it's like wait what i was like nature be scary because that's something that just naturally exists that can kill you just because of one particular chromosome in your body it's like that's scary um i just thought that was so interesting uh because even john was like wait what 
Um, and also the fact is that I like this because Car joins up with two uh, former adversaries, two enemies, uh, that kind of go through this, and immediately goes, ah, I kind of like Legends of Tomorrow, which they've still never bounced that, well, they, they kind of bounced that back again, because I was wondering, I always kind of wanted them to do that, where it's like, we get other villains too, maybe to join a crew, but now they kind of balance it back with the, eh, Legends of Tomorrow is Legends of Tomorrow, but leave it at that, but it's just kind of interesting her working with villains, because it's like, well, there's not a lot of like, super-powered people she can call upon to have her back in this particular case. And so the only people she knows is Livewire. And also, interesting, she brings up Sai, but I guess, like, Sai is someone powerful that she met this season. And it's something else kind of interesting, too, because, like, Fort Rise hasn't popped up since season one, I thought was kind of interesting thing. But also because, in retrospect, Livewire is, I think, she, I want to say she's the only main antagonist that um has... I'm not, not even main antagonist, but antagonist that has popped up from season one. She's the only recurring villain that's popped up subsequently since. To my recollection, I don't think anyone else has, even in season two, or definitely not this season, at least so far. So that's kind of an interesting thing, too. I love the fact that she was working at a diner. And it's like, oh, what? Oh, so, oh, she has a regular job. I was like, I was because I was looking at, oh, who's this supposed to be? And it's like, oh, it's a live Oh, you're working at a diner? Why? And the car is like, yeah, you're trying to be good so that rain doesn't come after you. I'm like, oh, really? That's your plan? I was like, wow, that's that's interesting. It's like, I'm a villain, but it's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going in hiding and I'm trying to be good so that rain can't sniff me out, essentially. Because once again, it's kind of like, does she have like evil radar or something like that? But once again, it's just, maybe, maybe she actually does. I don't know. They haven't dived into that, but. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing, but the fact is, Kara would go to her and reluctantly sigh for help. And working with Emra, they go, they headed to Fort Rod. So it's also interesting. I talked about it a little bit with the whole Blue Star thing. I thought that's kind of an interesting thing. I wonder, like, how is, is that something that really occurs in space or something like that? The whole Blue Star thing. But nevertheless, um, I was curious about Fort Rod, and it's just, oh, it's been slowly drifting in space the entire time, or is it? I guess it kind of got sucked. Uh, very close to this blue star and everything, which unfortunately, because there's no sun nearby, means Kara loses her abilities. Um, a lot of stuff to kind of run down. For one, interestingly enough, the fact is Rain still had her abilities while she was up there. I thought that was kind of interesting. Because uh, the fact is, it's like, because, I mean, we already know she doesn't necessarily, like, have the physio um, physiology of a Kryptonian. I mean, to be fair, like, mon has the powers of a, you know, he's a Daxamite, but he still kind of works the same way. But I guess the physiology between a Kryptonian and a Daxamite is very similar. But it's like, what is Rain's whole situation? Because she's like, yeah, you think I get my powers from something as stupid as the sun? So, like, not having it did change the fact that she still had her powers and everything, which, what does she draw her powers from then? Because, I mean, you would think that it plays a small part because the fact is that Crypt the Knight can cripple her to a certain extent. It's not, I mean, the fact of the matter is that's probably like the last bit that they had. So there's not enough to really like dampen her powers yet. But, and even if they did, it would only be temporary. Like, Crypt the Knight doesn't bring her down like it does a Kryptonian. Um, Daxamites have a weakness to lead. So I'm wondering what her weakness is then. I mean, I guess it's the whole Sam situation because she's struggling to keep Sam under control. But I kind of get into that in a little bit. But, um, I just thought that was kind of interesting, like, oh yeah, your powers are still intact, and I guess, like, oh, I guess that would make sense, wouldn't it? Also, the fact is, I wonder would that ever play another plot in the story, is the whole Fort Ross situation, because it's like, there's not that many people left on Fort Ross, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, because we saw one particular prisoner who was dead, it's like, well, most of the male prisoners that might have been up there are dead, it's probably just the, the ladies that are left, and even though we didn't see everyone, it's most likely, like, those people are scattered throughout the other parts of the sh uh, of Fort Ross, we didn't really, the... Uh, the show didn't take place in because they, they literally ran into like what four people the entire time that they were there on Fort Ross. So, and that woman Jinda was kind of interesting too. Like her powers, like even though she's this far away, she can still since she know like the whole rain situation. But it's also interesting her explanation to Kara as like, well, the fact is people like you have always been in the light. There's a little bit of darkness in everyone, which is like, and rain's all about justice. What, which I'm trying to understand it. It seems like it's mixed messages. Um, I don't know because it makes it seem like Jinda kind of like resents people who've been in the light, like people like. Kara, I mean, obviously, it's like I, you have a problem with her mom because her mom locked you up and everything. But it's also interesting that she's named after Fort Ross. Um, I, did they explain why she was? Was it because she was like the first one in prison there or something like that? Hence why they named it that. I don't. I remember they saying like Fort Ross got it named its name from her, but I don't remember them saying exactly why it is. But nevertheless, maybe they did, and I just kind of um, missed that part. But um. 
I kind of had a feeling that Rain was going to come there and kill her, not bring her back. Because it's like, yeah, you've been running your mouth off about stuff, so you kind of have to die now because you're too much of a hindrance. I guess it's also because it's like, you no longer matter to the plan. You've been kind of removed from the plan for a very long time. So it's like, you would just be a hindrance to it, a liability. So it's like, why not just remove you from the equation in the first place, you know? Or maybe the person that's running Rain didn't have the same vision, you know? Because it seemed like almost like they contradicted each other to a certain extent. Maybe, but maybe that's just me. Like I said... It's just like, oh, like you who live in a light, but it's like, isn't justice all about light? But I guess for her, it's more like kind of almost like a cure thing of like there is darkness to to get the light to kind of wipe out evil. It's like you have to go down around a little bit of darkness. Maybe that's, you know, maybe I'm completely off about it, but just I don't know. I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. Um, I also thought it was kind of interesting how Livewire, like, ability, like, when she was going up against those two, like, they were sucked out, in, like, they were sucked in space, and she was, like, she was outside the ship, and then she lightened her way, and I was like, that's pretty neat that you did that, I think, I think there are very few people who would be able to do that and survive the way you did, I was like, that's pretty badass that she did that, and the fact is, like, she shoots supercharging up and everything, and it also comes down to that conversation, I always think it's kind of an interesting conversation in superhero stuff, it's like, the whole conversation, like, no, you need to take this person down, like, don't just take them down, you need to kill them because Kara is saying that she's going to try and reason with Rain and it's like don't try and talk to her kill her like that's the only reason why I'm here like if I had the chance I, I'd fry you right now she's like really then do it and but Livewire couldn't because she's like I you know even you there's good within you so there's got to be good within Rain you know so and it, it, it sucks with the whole um, Livewire situation it really does because it's like she was, it just sucks, because, like, she went up, like, really, uh, epic battle against Rain, too, holding her own, and then, like, Rain's choking her, she's, like, stop hurting my friends, and it's like, oh, you think a, you think a Supergirl is your friend, because even you were worried when Kara disappeared, you're like, Supergirl, Supergirl, you're calling out for her, it's like, you legitimately care for her, in a weird way, I don't know, I guess, like, she gave you a new lease on life, especially the last time they met, she helped her out of that situation back in season two, so it's like, I guess she looks at Supergirl in a very different light. I mean, her biggest problem was with Kat in particular, but she had a problem with Supergirl, too. I was about to say, wasn't it with Kara as well, but it's like, no, 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 I'm thinking of Siobhan. That, cause I, that was one of the last times we saw them in Super, uh, season one, was, like, during the end when, like, Kara and Su um Barry kind of joined forces together, but nevertheless, um, but it's a conversation of like, no, I don't have to go down that route. I can find another way. Um, but sadly, like, um, Leslie took the blow for Kara, which sucks. Was not expecting him to kill one of them off like that. Holy crap. And also, side story kind of caught me off guard a little bit, too, because, like, I was under the impression, like, the moment her powers went away, I was like, oh, man, she's using this not opportunity. She's going to take over um, Emra's body, or she's going to use something she gets out of Emra's mind and uses against him, but it, it does legitimately, from the way the story goes, it's like, oh, she did just lose control of her abilities. At, at least that's what it might seem like. Maybe she actually took something else that we just don't know about. I mean, to fair, be fair, let's not forget, Emra's got a lot of, like, future stuff in her head, so who's to say, um... I forgot. I was thinking, like, in my head, I'm thinking, like, she's a mind reader or whatever. It's like, no, she's not a mind reader. Her power is all about inducing fear. Like, I don't know what. I think I forgot that it's kind of like where her power is. Like, it makes you feel your fear. So I'm curious. We never got to actually see it. But what is Emra's fear? We never get to uh, look at that. That was kind of an interesting thing now to think about. I, 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 the entire episode, I kept thinking like, oh man, she's going to take over Emra's body and they're just not going to know or like she implanted something. I was like, right, that's not even what size abilities are. She literally is a villain from the second episode of this season and I completely like blinked on it. I was like, right, I don't know why that just, I, I don't know. I think I think because her name Psy just messed with me and I was thinking psychic, which I guess would be more on the lines of Emra, especially with what she can do, kind of the telekinesis, but she can take it further. I mean, we still don't know tele telekinetically what else she can do, because we saw her uh, last episode moving stuff with her mind, but also creating a shield. Like, so, what other psychic ability she kind of has along those lines? That might be to the uh, fullest extent of it, but nevertheless, um, that just kind of caught me off guard. Like, she didn't really say anything, but I'm sure it, you definitely saw whatever it was she saw kind of rattled her a little bit. Which kind of makes more sense what happened with um, Rain because for her, um, her greatest fear is losing um, Ruby because in her mind, like Sam is trying to fight back. Like it's just Sam holding on to Ruby and Ruby being pulled into the darkness. So because she, when she was reaching into Rain, she was reaching into Sam and that kind of 
brought Sam to the surface for a moment because even she was like Supergirl and she was like Rain and that kind of triggered something inside of her to kind of go back. But uh, what we did learn from Jinda is that there are two because I was also that kind of popped up my memory popped up in my head this episode I was like yeah we don't actually know how many other world killers there are apparently there are two others Purity and Pestilence. Um, we meet one of them at the end of the episode. Her name is Julia. Uh, she gets hit by a car, but, you know, bounces back, which is kind of interesting, too. I appreciate this little small detail. They have different colored eyes. In a sense of Rain's eyes are, like, flicker red when she's in control. In, this, in Julia's case, her eyes flicker yellow. I'd assumed, I, I, I could see a pestilence situation going on there, but maybe that's more of purity. Just maybe that was kind of what that's supposed to be a reference to, like her uh, pushing her friend out of the way. And I, mean, I don't know. It seems like because that all draws comes out during heightened emotions and just adrenaline because it's like well Sam's abilities came about when she was trying to save Ruby so I'm wondering like is there no other way to activate them other than that like were they were they damaged when they came here because the only ones only one we know of coming to earth was rain so it's like what about purity and pestilence how was that a thing did they escape from, were they sent here at an earlier point in time earlier point than Sam um, storyline wise prior to Krypton blowing up or was like you know was Rain the last one to go before the planet blew or what you know I'm also curious to see do they I mean it seems like their powers might be relatively I mean, at least for now because it's like well they have superhuman strength so once again it does seem like this is pulled from them being Kryptonians and stuff like that but then again like once again where do their powers come from what do they feed upon you know maybe it's gonna be kind of one of those abstract things that they feed on kind of like you know, something like fear or something. I don't think that's going to be the case, but maybe it could be something like that. Because I don't see any other means of, like, how can you just be as powerful as you are? Maybe it's just because they were artificially made or born. So because of that, they aren't necessarily bound to the same limitations that a Kryptonian are. A Kryptonian would be a Kryptonian art. I don't know why I said it like that. Um... I don't know, it was just kind of an interesting um, thing. I'm also curious, like, what this means going forward for Supergirl and Psy, because they kind of end off on good terms, too, which is kind of interesting, considering the fact is that uh, that was just one of your villains this uh, this season, and you're on good terms with them, which hurt. I guess that means we might be able to count on Psy going forward. Wasn't expecting that, really, but I guess just after everything that went down this episode, it was just kind of like, maybe she kind of saw Supergirl in a different light. And I guess that adds to the aspect of, like, you know, Supergirl, like, the fact of the matter is you can reach people, don't. Don't give up on yourself in that regard. Because Mono kind of explains it too. Because it's like, the fact is, Livewire went along with you. She even was willing to sacrifice herself from you. She did sacrifice herself for you. Shows the fact in the matter is, you were able to do that. That wasn't some Supergirl. That was, that was Kara. Like, you know... Once again, adding that element of, like, you know, she's always felt like, you know, especially recently, like, the Kara side of her is a weakness. It's like, Kara easily is her strength, one of her strengths. That compassionate side of herself adds adds a different level of strength that she wouldn't have as Supergirl. Because being just Supergirl, as we have we saw earlier in the season, who she is is just being Supergirl, kind of hardening herself. But that human side of her, that, that Kara side of her... It's also, you know, makes her who she is, you know, so. Uh, sadly, we still don't had know the grand picture of what this whole situation is like for um, Rain and what they have planned. Because it's like, they made sure to shut Jinda up before she blew too much information, you know, so. Another kind of subplot in this episode I thought was kind of interesting is the whole Brainy. Because all Brainy did most of the episode is complain. It's like, oh my god, your technology is crap. It's like, oh, what about this? Well, we don't have that. Oh, of course. Because that couldn't be useful. It's like, <clears throat> with everything happening on Fort Ross, it's so interesting. Because all he did was kind of complain. It was like, oh, this and that, this and that. And, you know, Wynn's trying to help him out at points. But it's so like, no, I don't need your help. But then it's almost like, oh, Wynn's the one that came up with the ultimate solution in the, in the episode. You almost have Brainy, Brainy looking around like, oh, what, you know. So they worked together at the end. But it was just kind of an interesting thing. Because Wynn's like, oh, yeah, I yeah, check this out. And he's like, oh, really? This is what Supergirl relies on to be saved? And it's like, my God, I can't believe she survives at all. Like... I'm like, I can't believe this is her support. I'm just so disgusted by their level of technology. I thought that was kind of interesting. But I think that also plays into the aspect of, like, realizing things like you don't need the most fancy technology to kind of get the things done. Because, hey, they've saved the world and kicked some serious tail, like, with the level of technology they have. So I guess it's almost a situation of, like, you're kind of spoiled from the future. 
Um, a conversation I thought was kind of interesting too is that Mono was like, oh yeah, that he led, like, cause he was like, he knows what Kara is going through, losing someone, losing Livewire. He's like, there's plenty of people that he's led into battle that he's lost. So it's kind of, huh? So, I mean, Mono is kind of like the reason why the Legion started and everything, but still, it's still kind of catchy off guard to think, right? You, kind of, the fact is, you've led people into battle like that's kind of an interesting thing that you are in fact the leader. It's just, but I mean, it's like to him, it's like he is able to be the leader he is is because of Kara. Which I'm still waiting for that twist. I, it, it won't happen, but because even he acknowledges, like he realizes how hard it is for him, how hard it is on Car for him being there. Uh, but they are talking, so it is easy things. Livewire did joke like, "Oh yeah, you must hate Emra. You know the fact is she's married to your ex boyfriend and everything." So Car never really talked about it too much, but I think it is a situation of like, it does bother her, but she is trying not to let it, you know, she is trying to find her way forward, you know, which kind of plays into Maggie's story this episode, which, why not, not Maggie, um, Alex's story, which jump into that, um, I, I love what they, immediately when they had Ruby staying with Alex, I was like, they're kind of setting up that story of how, like, Alex is like, oh, yeah, I want a daughter. And, you know, the time she's spending with Ruby and they're having fun and everything makes me kind of think, like, oh, yeah, that's what this episode was kind of setting up. Especially when you compare it to, like, um, the fact is that she gets a text from Maggie. Maggie's like, could you, like, look for my passport or mail it to me? And it's just kind of like, the fact is that she's with Ruby at that time. And then that Maggie kind of pops back into the story into that certain regard like that just do a, you know, a text or whatever. But it was still just kind of interesting um, how that played out like that. It's just a situation where Alex thought she was moving past it. But in that one instant, she kind of crumbled a little because it's just like, well, here's my life. You know, it's just like I had this clear cut picture of what my life was going to be with Maggie and everything. And I thought I was moving forward. But like, look. Look where I am. Like that one text kind of said the moment she heard it was from Maggie, it made her stop doing what she was doing, you know? And it just exes have that kind of control over you sometimes. It's just kinda of like you like I said, you thought your life was gonna be one thing and it turns out to be another. Um but I did appreciate what she did for Ruby. It's like, oh this girl's doing bad talking bad stuff about you. Okay. It's like, oh yeah, shows up with her FBI badge and everything. It's like, oh yeah, letting a girl know and everything. It's like, oh you committed a crime. Like, oh you better better not hear anything from this about this again. You better apologize to Ruby too, because I'm gonna come after you, which is like kind of an abuse of power, but at the same time it's super cool. Which is like, hey, you have an FBI agent kinda as a friend, might as well utilize that to your best uh, Billy, she's like, okay, there's a girl that lives, like, down the street who, like, pushed me in kindergarten. She's like, don't push it. Uh, but I love that they were bonding like that, so it's kind of pretty neat. But it also seems like that was also set up for the fact is that Sam, like, confides into Alex about the whole, like, missing time thing, which is kind of interesting. I mean, because those pieces are slowly getting there because it's like, Sai was inside of, um, well, because, I, 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 once again, completely forget, Sai doesn't actually, she doesn't see what people fear, right? Yeah, her powers don't work like that. She can implant the fear. That was enough to throw them off, but it's like, it's not enough for a card. But oh my gosh, she was thinking about some little girl named Ruby. It's like, size power doesn't work like that. It just draws, it creates, makes you like see, kind of drown in your own fear, essentially. So they haven't gotten that side of things. But the fact is that, you know, now it's like freaking, um, Sam out because it's like holy crap like I'm missing time I thought I was going to go somewhere but I didn't it's like okay Lena's been calling me like crazy like she's freaking out and so Alex is going to be helping her with that and I'm curious to see what happens when the time gets revealed it's like holy crap you know Sam is rain you know what would that do especially because her and Carr have gotten super close and everything so that was always going to be the complication going forward about that. So, especially because it also seems like Rain is supposed to be the like one who rules all all three of them, which I guess that kind of makes sense in a sense because it's like almost like a triforce situation. There being three of them and everything. I thought she was going to list them off almost like some seven deadly sins type of thing because she said power too. So it made me think there might have been a third one, but I thought there was a third one called a fourth one called power. It's just those three: rain, purity, and pestilence. Because it's almost like a four horseman type of situation, but they pick, uh, pick three just because, I guess, like, strength, what is it, wisdom. I'm not that familiar with Zelda. It's going to bother the crap out of me. Nevertheless, it's just, it's just kind of interesting. And really quickly, too, there's another thing I want to add on the end to. The fact is that her mom pops up more and more this season. Like, her mom, it feels like her mom is playing a bigger part in this season. 
Uh, makes me wonder is that how big of a part is that going to play going forward? Because the fact of the matter is, there was that lady on Fort Rogers. Oh my God, you have the House of L on your chest, like blah blah blah. So it makes me wonder, like. Because her mom's become pretty prevalent in this season, popping up from time to time in di different shapes and forms. So I'm curious about that. Um, I don't know what that all, whether that's going to be something or not. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't. It seems like it might all be alluding to something later on. You know, maybe it's, you know. Because Kara ended up learning in season one that, like, her parents made a lot of mistakes. They weren't saints. They weren't the people that she put on, you know. Um, God, what's the... She put on a pedestal, you know? So, I don't know. We'll just, we'll just have to wait and see. But really, that's all I want to talk about this episode. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.